Okay, um, so chapter 10, section 11 has to do with acid-base equivalence. You may recall that um, for ions, we calculated ion equivalence by taking into account the charge on the ion. Like a calcium 2 plus ion would carry two equivalents of charge. Um, and a sodium 1 plus would carry only one equivalent of charge. So for acids and bases, we use the same word, equivalence, um, but uh, it represents instead the number of protons which can be donated. So um, the uh, equivalent is defined as uh, one mole divided by the number of H3O plus or OH minus produced. Okay, so um, if I wanted uh, one equivalent of NaOH, then that would be one mole divided by one, or one mole. because NaOH will produce only one hydroxide. Um, if I want one equivalent of H2SO4, then that would be one mole divided by two, because H2SO4 is capable of donating two protons. And so uh, a half a mole of sulfuric acid is actually going to provide one equivalent of acid because it has sort of twice the acid uh, reactivity. Um, uh, something like calcium hydroxide, so one equivalent of calcium hydroxide would be 0 0.5 moles of calcium hydroxide. So that's the way equivalents work. I hope that's pretty intuitive. Uh, basically these, you get uh, two for one, um, and so you need half as, half as many moles to get the same amount of, of acid. Um, and so because of uh, the, the fact that uh, not all acids have one equivalent per mole, uh, sometimes we'll talk about a uh, new concentration unit. And this is normal concentration. Uh, it's a terribly bland name, but the normal concentration is equal to the equivalence per liter. So one normal of NaOH is one molar of NaOH. Uh, but one normal of H2SO4, uh, that's one equivalent per liter. And remember that one equivalent of H2SO4 was actually just half a mole. So this would be 0 0.5 molar H2SO4. And um, so the normal concentration is what you really care about if you're wanting to do acid-base reactions. I don't care how many moles of sulfuric acid I have, what I really want to know is how many moles of protons can be donated in acid-base reactions. So for that, I want the normal concentration. Um, and so with that, I want to move on to um, the concept of titration. So titration is a laboratory technique that's used to determine the concentrations of an acid or a base with unknown concentration. The idea is um, if you have an acid with unknown concentration, you're going to react it very slowly with a basic solution whose concentration you know very precisely. And you're going to uh, monitor that reaction and stop it at exactly the point where you've reached a neutral solution, where you've uh, added the same amount of base uh, 
as the acid that you started with. And because you added that base slowly and you were able to measure exactly how much you added, you're able to then um, uh, use a formula to figure out what was the initial concentration of your unknown. So um, the analyte is your unknown. That means you don't know the concentration. You, you uh, need to know that it is an acid. Um, and you just don't know its concentration. And then the titrant is a standardized solution. And what standardized means is that you've carefully characterized its concentration, so you know exactly how much, um, mo how many moles per liter uh, your titrant is. And uh, your analyte could be an acid, so you'll use a base titrant. Your analyte could be a base, so you'll use an acid titrant. Um, so let's look at uh, some figures that are going to show us uh, what a titration might look like. So. Let's make it fill the screen. Okay, so um, uh, here we have um, an Erlenmeyer flask at the bottom. The Erlenmeyer flask is where you'll put your analyte, and above it is an instrument called a burette. And we'll get a closer look at the burette in just a minute, but the burette is it going to hold your titrant. And it's got markings on the side so that you can measure the volume that is contained in the burette and you can measure the volume that is being delivered by comparing the final and initial amounts. And then at the bottom there is a stopcock or a knob that will allow you to um, uh, slowly add titrant and then cut it off right when it needs to be cut off. So you'll put your analyte in the Erlenmeyer flask and then you're going to want to add uh, one of the color indicators that we discussed last time. Uh, something that's going to change color as you transition from acid to base if you are titrating an unknown acid with a basic titrant. Or something that will change color as you go from base to acid if you're using a basic uh, analyte and an acidic titrant. And I, those are kind of the same thing, but ideally you want it to go from colorless to colored. So you might choose a different um, color indicator in those two cases. So you add the color indicator and it will be um, uh, colorless as you, add the, um, as you add the titrant. And what's happening is you'll add a little bit of that titrant, say it's a base, because uh, uh, you have an acidic analyte. As you add that base, it gets immediately reacted away, and so the solution remains colorless. Uh, you keep adding the base until eventually the uh, color indicator shows that your solution has turned basic. And what that means is that you've consumed all of the acid, and if you're careful, you've added only a teeny tiny amount of extra base. And so the solution turns basic more or less the instant that you've consumed all of your unknown acid. And then you can uh, go ahead and look at the burette and see how many milliliters were, um, uh, were consumed in this reaction. And that's going to tell you um, the um, number of moles of analyte that you added. And you can use that to get the number of moles of your titrant. Uh, I'm sorry, the number of moles of titrant that you added, and you can use that to get the moles of your analyte. So the idea is that um, at what we call the At what we call the equivalence point, that's where you've added just precisely enough. Um, at the equivalence point, the, um, the equivalence of acid are going to precisely be equal to the equivalence of 
base. This is the moles of H plus ions and the moles of OH minus ions. Uh, these are the equivalents that we just talked about 10 minutes ago. So um, how many equivalents of acid are there? Well, that's going to be the normal concentration of your analyte times the volume of your analyte. And how many equivalents of base have you added? Well, that's going to be the normal concentration of your titrant times the volume added of your titrant. And so um, uh, this is the titration equation. And we can go ahead and apply it uh, with a sample problem. Okay, so 25 milliliters of unknown hydrochloric acid are titrated with, and we'll go ahead and use our, our example here. Um, what is that? That looks like 22.20, have I read that right? Uh, with 22.20 milliliters, and I'll get that picture on so you can read it. 22.20 milliliters of 1.00 normal OH minus solution. Okay, so that could be a one molar sodium hydroxide or maybe it's a half molar magnesium hydroxide, but it's one normal solution of uh, sodium hydroxide. So if I want to solve this, I'm going to uh, take the uh, normal concentration of my analyte, that's actually unknown. My volume of the analyte is the 25 milliliters. That's the initial amount that was in the Erlenmeyer flask before I even began, times 25 milliliters. And that's going to equal the normal concentration of my titrant, that was 1.00 normal, and its volume of 22.20 milliliters. Now here we don't need to convert from milliliters to liters because these two units will agree. Um, and, oh, I've gone and left my calculator inside, so I'll pull up the one on the computer. All right, give me just a second here. That's not it. There it is. Okay, um, so we're going to take um, 1 times 22.20 divided by 25. That's all we need, and it looks like it's 0 0.888 normal. So that is how you find the uh, concentration of your unknown analyte. Um, so that is the process called titration. Um, the reason why uh, the color indicator works well is because at the equivalence point, the pH is swinging very wildly. We calculated last time how adding even just a little bit of acid or just a little tiny bit of base to neutral water that is not buffered by any um, uh, buffer uh, solution, uh, just a tiny bit of acid or base is going to swing the pH really wildly. So right at the theoretical perfect equivalence point, uh, you'll have neutral water. The acid and the base will have completely neutralized each other. And if you add just the smallest amount of titrant beyond that, then the pH will swing enough to change your color indicator's uh, color. Uh, technically, the point where you stop the titration will be called the end point. Uh, and the end point 
is just uh, probably going to be a little bit beyond the equivalence point. But you can't do any better than that, and so the endpoint, we treat it as if it is the equivalence point. Okay, I'm trying to decide if I should do another video. I think I'll do the next section in this video because it will be pretty short. Okay, so um, when a salt dissolves in uh, water, and salt is an ionic compound, when it dissolves in water, it's going to break apart into its cation and anion. And a, a lot of uh, ionic compounds, when they dissolve, are going to affect the pH of a solution, which means the salt is either an acid or a base. Um, but in order, to under, in order to predict whether the salt is an acid or a base, we're going to have to look at its ions individually. So let's uh, look at a couple of different salts. I could have NaCl, and when we dissolve that, it's going to form uh, Na plus and Cl minus ions in water. Uh, I could also have something like um, NH4Br, and that's going to form NH4 plus and Br minus, and I could do something like potassium, oops, HSO4, potassium hydrogen sulfate, that will break apart into K plus, plus HSO4 minus, or I could have something like Na2CO3, and that's going to break apart into two Na plus plus CO3, two minus. So each of these, uh, we want to be able to determine whether they will make the solution acidic or basic or neutral when it uh, dissolves in water. To do that, we're going to look at the cation and the anion independently and determine if it has any acid base property. So sodium ion, is it an acid or a base? And um, the answer is that sodium is neutral. You can kind of think of it as the conjugate to sodium hydroxide, uh, but sodium hydroxide is a strong base, which means that its conjugate isn't really an acid and that makes sodium neutral. Chloride is also neutral. It is the conjugate to hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid was one of our six strong acids, and because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, that means its conjugate, the chloride ion, is not um, a base at all. Instead, it's really neutral. And so overall, sodium chloride is neutral. It will have no effect on the pH of water when it dissolves. Well, let's do the same thing for ammonium bromide. So uh, bromide is neutral for the same reason that chloride is. Hydrobromic acid is one of our six strong acids, and so its conjugate is neutral. But ammonium, NH4+, this is an acid. It is a weak acid, but we could look up its Ka value and, um, uh, and it's uh, definitely going to donate some of its protons. And so with an acidic cation and a neutral anion, this is going to be an acid. Ammonium bromide will decrease the pH of a solution when you dissolve it in water. We'll do the same thing for potassium hydrogen sulfate. So potassium is neutral. These metal cations don't often do anything. Uh, you could think of it as the conjugate to potassium hydroxide. HSO4 minus, 
Now it carries a negative uh, charge, but remember that's the um, part of the series of sulfuric acid. H2SO4 is a strong acid that goes 100% to HSO4 minus. And then HSO4 minus will then release some of its protons as a weak acid to go to SO4 2 minus. So this is actually an acid, even though it is negatively charged. And there aren't a lot of negatively charged ions that are an acid. There are plenty that are amphoteric or amphiprotic that can go either way. But this is an example of one that is just strictly an acid. And so acid plus neutral, that is going to make potassium hydrogen sulfate an acid. And then sodium carbonate, sodium is neutral. Carbonate is a weak base. Um, so the carbonate can accept protons, and that makes this compound a base. So um, all of the examples that I will give you are going to be pretty straightforward like these. I'll give you one example of something that might be a lot more difficult. I'll give you two examples, just, just to show you how bad it can get. So the first example would be something like uh, ammonium acetate. So ammonium acetate will break apart into NH4 plus and CH3, CO2 minus. And ammonium is a weak acid. And acetate is a weak base. So what is this? Well, I don't really know. If you wanted to solve this, you could look up the Ka value for ammonium and the Kb value for acetate and compare their relative strengths. I think that's not too difficult to wrap your head around, but it is beyond the scope of this course. So I won't give you one where you have both an acid and a base together in the same compound. Uh, and to show you just how bad it can, can get, um, you could have something like NH for <coughs> two HPO4, uh, and this will break apart into two NH3 pluses and HPO4 minus, uh, sorry, that's HPO4 two minus, and this is an acid, and HPO4 two minus is Amphoteric. It can be an acid or it can be a base depending on the context of its reaction partner. Uh, so in this case, it would probably act as a base, uh, reacting with some of the NH4 plus that was generated. But uh, again, it would get very complicated. You would need to compare three K values, the Ka for ammonium, the Ka for hydrogen phosphate, and the Kb for hydrogen phosphate. Anyway, both of these are problems that are complex enough that uh, you don't need to worry about encountering them. It'll all come down to uh, looking at the cation and the anion. One and, at, well, at most one will have acidic or basic properties and that will govern the properties of the ionic compound as a whole. Okay, and uh, with that, that concludes chapter 10 for us.